Welcome to episode 177 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer, producer, and actor and comedian Chad Ridgely. Chad has a couple of films that are finishing up right now. He moved out to, moved out to L.A. from the East Coast a number of years ago and just started working to move his career forward. He sold a pilot to a studio, and now he's got two feature films that are coming out. We walk through all of this and much, much more, so stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any, any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts, and then just look for episode number 177. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a whole bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I'm working on. So once again, I'm still working on post-production on my crime action thriller feature film, The Pinch. Things are moving along slowly but surely. My composer um, last week sent me the first maybe 20 or so minutes of the film and he that he had scored. So that sounded great. So that's moving along very, very nicely heard from my dialogue editor. He's making some good progress. Heard from my sound designer. He said he should be done with his first pass in the next week or so. The guys who have been doing the special effects, you know, there's just different shots. I think there's probably maybe maybe 15 or 18 effect shots throughout the movie. And um, slowly they're getting those shots done and sending those in. So that's going along very, very nicely. I've got my ADR session set up um, with my lead actor for this Friday. I'm going to um, record a bunch of voiceover. There's one line that um, we need to get from the um, from the film and then a um, bunch of voiceover. So I'm going to record that on Friday and then um, get that to my dialogue editor to incorporate into the dialogue edit. I'm meeting with my colorist tomorrow to go over that. He has a first pass of the color correction done, um, so that's all great. But I'm going to just go and meet with him and actually sit in the room, and we're going to go over a few scenes together. I don't have a lot of experience. In fact, I have no real experience with color correction or color grading, so I'm having trouble even really giving him good notes. So I'm just hoping if we can sit in the room and really talk about the different scenes, we can kind of figure out um, what direction to go, um, whether we go one direction or another direction. I'm not even sure of the vocabulary <clears throat> well enough to give him the good notes. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, a good long session with him will solve that problem. So I feel like um, I finally, finally am on the home stretch with the pinch. Again, it's going to take some more time. There's definitely a lot more work to be done, but things are moving along nicely. And um, as I said, this, this kind of feels like the home stretch. So I'm starting to think about distribution and film festivals for The Pinch. If anyone has any insight into some specific film festivals, please drop me an email. Sometimes it's hard to know which festivals are good and which ones aren't even worth entering. So if you know of one that's especially good, please just send me an email and let me know. And when I say good, all I really mean is a festival that's well run, organized, has good attendance. You know, I've been to those film festivals where literally nobody is in the screenings except for the filmmakers. And and it just doesn't feel like those festivals oftentimes are even worth going to, much less entering, spending the money and entering. So if you have some real experience with a festival, please, again, just drop me an email and um, let me know what your experience has been with, with those festivals. You don't even, not so much the bad festivals. Really, I'm just looking for recommendations, um, ones that you think are good. Just, just send me an email. I'd love to find a festival in Los Angeles to premiere the pinch at, since most of the cast and crew is here in Los Angeles. It would be nice to have a premiere here and then all the cast and crew could show up and you know they're they're usually very fun when you have a full packed house cast and crew is there a bunch of other people are there um, those screenings are usually very very fun there's just a lot of good energy and um, so finding a festival in LA I think would be would be super ideal but um, 
doesn't always happen happen as nice and clean as that so i'm thinking the same thing on distributors if you have some good experiences with different distributors who work on low budget films please do let me know that as well i wouldn't mind to start building a list of potential places that i could take this film to once it's done so Again, please do email me if you have any um, information on any of these two things. You can send an email to info at sellingyourscreenplay.com. So also, I finished a first draft of my horror thriller script last week. I've been plugging away on that for the last couple of months. I'm hoping to have it polished up probably in the next few weeks, and then I can start to figure out what I'm going to do with that. Like the pinch, I've written it so that it should be fairly easy and inexpensive to produce. Um, I've had a real good time working on the pinch, so I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And I would say this is something that um, it feels realistic. I could probably raise, you know, roughly the same amount of money, maybe a little more, and um, it could it could get done. As I said, I've I've written it in such a way that the cast is fairly limited, and um, the locations, all the locations, are fairly easy to get, and places that I think I, I have access to. So. We'll see, but the um, next couple of weeks, I'll be working on that and polishing that up. So that's what I'm working on. Now let's get into the main segment. Today, I'm interviewing writer, producer, actor, and comedian, Chad Ridgely. Here is the interview. Welcome, Chad, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Absolutely, my pleasure. So to start out, maybe you can give us a quick overview of your background. Um, where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment industry? I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., uh, born in Washington, D.C., raised out there, went to uh, University of Maryland, studied uh, radio, television, and film out there at first. Um, let's see. Always been interested in filmmaking. Uh, in fact, my uh, my grandmother gave me an 8-millimeter film camera, which I used to shoot my uh, my first my first movie when I was 8 years old. Huh. Uh, it was it was, uh, it was on 8-millimeter film, and it was... Uh, it was called Hole Stop the Rain, uh, and based on the, the Creedence uh, uh, Clearwater song. Uh -huh. um, I, was, I was trying to make a very artistic statement at eight years old because uh, it was uh, it was a it was an anti-war film um, that I made at eight, which we shot in my basement at, at my parents' house in my backyard, nice. uh, u using some models and whatnot. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, I actually had to do physical film splicing on that. Yeah, sure, sure. Which was. Uh, something you don't see too much of these days. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, that's that's how I got started. Okay, and then talk about maybe some of your first steps to actually turning this into a career. Um, you graduated from college. What did you do next? Um, just before the interview, you mentioned you do a lot of stand-up comedy acting. Maybe just take us into those first couple of steps, um, actually turning this into a career and, and, and earning a few bucks. Well, I'd always wanted to, to pursue acting and writing and comedy. Um, but uh, after college, I actually worked uh, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. as a police officer for a number of years. Huh. And uh, it was it's kind of funny. I never actually wanted to uh, pursue law enforcement, but I got a role on a TV show that was shooting out there. So I went on some ride alongs uh, with the police uh, where, you know, they let you ride around in the car with them during their shift. And totally by accident, I fell in love with the job. I was like, wow, this is exciting. This is, you know, I want to do this. So I, I decided I would do that for a few years and then uh, and then move out to L.A. Um, so that uh, that actually took uh, took a little bit of uh, convincing me to leave that job because it was such it was such a great career. I really, really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it wasn't my true calling. My true calling was certainly uh, the acting, writing and producing. So came out to L.A., started doing uh, producing my own web series uh comedy web series, sketch comedy stuff, and uh, ended up selling a, uh, a show to Fox. Um, they ended up producing a pilot called the uh, the Chad Ridgely Show, which uh, uh, unfortunately didn't go anywhere, but it was still a, a real big victory to have that kind of a, uh, a sale. And it was very validating to have a, uh, a network uh, studio be interested in, in my content. So yeah. then I was like, okay, so I'm on the right track. So I started doing that, and I started doing more uh, short films, and, uh, and now I'm doing features. Okay, let me back up just a little bit. I get a lot of emails from people and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think your perspective would be interesting. I get a lot of emails from people. They're in a similar situation where they have a career way outside of Hollywood and they're wondering, how do I know when it's time to make that move? Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about your preparation. Did you save a bunch of money? Um, you know, and how did you even know where in LA to move? Maybe just some, some tips and tricks about people that are thinking about moving to LA. Maybe you have some advice for them. Sure. Um, 
Now, <laughs> I didn't have as, you're gonna need some money, of course. Now, I didn't do it probably the most conventional way because when I when I moved out to LA, I just, I just did it cold turkey. I drove across the country, it took me three days. Um, I had all my stuff that I was bringing in my car, so I didn't wanna leave it and get a hotel room for fear someone would break into my car. <laughs> So I slept in my car each night and then I would wake up and just keep driving. So I got to L.A. and uh, I didn't know a soul out here. Um, I didn't I didn't know anybody, but uh, I kind of dove in um, feet first. And of course, um, as my luck would have it, uh, that's right when the writer's strike uh, began to, to occur. So there was a lot of work that wasn't happening for uh, for writers and, and actors mm -hmm. at that time. But um I started uh, just doing the legwork and getting the uh, getting you know the headshots out there, the resumes out there, the writing samples out there, and it was really it was very very tedious and uh, and it can be very discouraging. Um, but uh, my mentality was, I'm doing this and uh, I'm not quitting. So I didn't have a plan B, and uh, and I didn't give myself a timeline. Um, so if you're going to move out to LA and pursue this. Uh, full time, you can't really give yourself a timeline. A lot of people say, "Oh, I'm going to give it a year. Or I'm going to give it two years, and then if that doesn't work, then I'm going to go back to, you know, Michigan or Maryland or wherever and and resume that kind of life." But you can't really have that because it doesn't really work that way. It's not like a traditional career path that, as you're aware, yeah. um, as a writer yourself, that you know, if I do this, it. If you're in a job at the police department, you know that if you're on for this many years and you take this test, then you'll be promoted to this rank and then you can move up to this rank. And, you know, in this career, it, it doesn't work that way. There's so many different ways to get there. Um, you have to you have to be committed and you certainly can't be easily intimidated because, uh, as, as you know, Ashley, it's just uh, moving from one rejection to another rejection to another and not letting that discourage you. Yeah. Where did you actually pull in and live? And would you advise people live in a, in that area? Where did you actually live in LA? When I first got out here, I just I rented a place temporarily in Culver City, right next to the the Culver City Studios there, and I stayed there for just a, just about a month, and then um, then I found another place in Studio City, and uh, I've been in Studio City in that kind of vicinity ever since. I love that area. It's close to the studios. It's close to the freeways. And uh, it's really been my home since I've been out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coincidentally, I'm from Maryland. And when I moved out here, me and my buddy, we pulled off right on Laurel Canyon. And we were just a little north right on Valley Village where Magnolia and Laurel Canyon um, cross. So a very, very similar it's... story yeah, to yours. How much money did you save, um, if you don't mind sharing that, just in terms of, you know, what, do people, what can people expect in terms of apartments and, and food and cost of living if they're going to come out here for a, a few months or even a year without working? Well, um, I really didn't have as much of a cushion as I would like. I think, you know, I probably only had, you know, maybe five grand or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went away fast. You know, you're paying security deposit. You've got to, and then I found out you have to buy a refrigerator. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's out here. They didn't have refrigerators. And I, they didn't have that back east. Like everywhere in Maryland, D.C., Virginia, that whole area, you'd rent a place and it had a refrigerator. But they came out here and I'm like, what's... What's that? And they're like, oh, well, that's for, you can put a refrigerator there if you want. Like, if I want, yeah. what am I just going to hang meat there if I don't want a refrigerator? Like, yeah. do I have several? Oh, I'll put the red one there. So uh, you have to budget for the refrigerator, although they seem to be doing more refrigerators in apartments these days. But uh, um, I really lived off my credit cards for about the first, first year. And uh, that was really, really, really terrifying because... Uh, I had all this stuff going out and nothing coming in, and you're thinking, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to get on a show, or I'm going to, I'm going to sell this, or and, and I'll be fine. But mm -hmm. you know, sometimes that doesn't happen, and it didn't for me. So it was a really, it was a, it was really tough um, to persevere and get through that. Um, when I first moved out here, you know, I had gone from a career job where I had uh, seniority and uh, uh, you know steady income to coming out here t and working. I was working three jobs at one point. I was working two full-time gigs and then another part-time gig. Just it was it was really just hellacious, mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> um, somehow I persevered through that, and things started to to take a turn. But um, you certainly need to be committed. Yeah, um, I would say yeah. that would be the most the most 
the strongest I, advice I could give was just if you're going to do it, make sure that you are not going to half-ass it and you are going to commit it. Um, for me, like I said, I did not have a plan B, and uh, that has really helped propel me through those tough times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about the Chad Ridgely show um, and maybe how you went about um, getting that sold to Fox. Um, I think that would be an interesting show. Maybe you can just tell us what that show was all about and then um, go into some of the details of how you actually got that sold. Sure. Um, one of the things that I learned early on in L.A., is you have to be able to make your own content. So that's what I started doing pretty much early on. I started making my own sketches, uh, producing my own sketch comedy stuff, and just blasting it out online. I had a, a number of uh, pretty successful web series. Um, there, was a, there was a show I did called uh, Healthy Tips, which is about this Russian doctor who uh, thinks the show is called Healthy Tits. And uh, it's uh, it's network safe. I mean, it's all innuendos and play on words and stuff like that. So uh, he was he, he had a pretty successful run. And then I had another character that uh, uh, was hosting a, a game show called The Gay or Not Gay Game Show. So we did a number of episodes of that. And uh, I was also in Groundlings, which is a, a you know, improv school and improv troupe. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a number of time. And Groundlings is uh, is very character based, very character oriented. So it really gave me a lot of strengths in terms of making individual characters for for sketches. And uh, so I had all these uh, I had all this content, and some of it was doing pretty well. So I blasted it out to uh, um, all the studios, hoping, of course, that I would hear something, but not really expecting to hear anything back. And then um, at the time, uh, I got a call from Fox Atomic, which uh, they did Miss March and uh, uh, The Rocker, stuff like that. They uh, Eventually, they went away. They folded into just Fox Studios in general. But uh, I ended up getting a meeting with Fox and went in, and it was a real successful uh, pitch meeting. And... Uh, that led to another meeting, which led to them offering to uh, to produce the pilot, which was amazing. And I think at that point, I was definitely hooked on L.A. I, I'd been out here a couple of years at that point, and uh, uh, for me, there was no turning back. Because once I had that kind of a validation that the stuff that I thought was funny, somebody else thought was funny and was willing to put money behind it, then I was I was like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. Okay, so let's um, talk about this. You keep saying the pilot never, the pilot never went anywhere. Yeah, but uh, it was still, it was still a, a phenomenal win. I mean, pretty much just a, you know, one in a million shot to be able to navigate that treacherous path to to, to land that. Mm -hmm. So even if even if you have something that just gets that far, that's still a win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So um, you keep saying you blasted it out to the studios. What exactly does that mean? Did you get email addresses? Did you make cold calls? Did you send letters? Exactly what does blasting these short films to the studios mean? Um, when I sent the sketches out, it was all—it was just email. I had uh, gotten some email lists. I think I had made a couple of calls, and uh, I had gotten there was a number of handbooks that were going around some various acting organizations that I was in that had uh, it was just kind of like a treasure trove of information in terms of uh, contacts. And so I went through and I picked as many as I could and uh, sent them all out with a little personalized uh, email. And uh, I got a response. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you mentioned the groundlings. I just want to touch on that quickly. Um, a lot of writers um, a lot of writers, a lot of comedians get into that. Maybe you can talk about that. And even if there's some other similar type programs, um, my understanding of the Groundlings, the way you kind of start is you like pay some sort of a fee to take classes or something there. And then once you kind of get in the flow of things, you eventually work your way up and then they have like a Saturday night showcase. But I, I've never done it. So this is just sort of my, you know, peripheral understanding of it. But maybe you can explain kind of what it is, because I'm sure there are some some writers listening to this that might want to get involved and learn more about that. Sure. And they do have a writing program and it is primarily a school. They, they, they do bring you in, you audition for the, for the school and uh, then they put you into a certain track. And of course you're paying as you go and, and move up the ladder until uh, you get to uh, uh, what is called their uh, Sunday company, which is like a, a little live SNL, if you will, which uh, runs for a while. Um, so I, I did that for a couple of years, and they have they have improv. It starts off with improv, and then they make you uh, learn to develop characters, and learn to develop uh, 
uh, like sketch comedy writing style and uh, finding the beats as a writer. Um, they also, uh, uh, they work with uh, the students. Uh, they have a stand-up class as well. Um, but uh, as a writer, for me, it helped me with the development of the sketches and it helped me with the uh, uh, development of the characters. Because um, uh, they really, they're really strong in, in the character development. Um, so you'll, if you just participate in that, you'll end up with uh, a number of solid characters, which you can plug into your different sketches. And then, of course, you'll be writing for those as well. Um, I had already had a pretty good idea of, of the sketch structure because I had been doing that uh, at the same time and, and before. But uh, it, it's great. And then another nice thing about it, of course, is, is just the networking from your classmates. Uh, you're going to meet so many people that are all ambitious and doing the same thing. And you're going to find people that you can plug into your own stuff that you're making. And, uh, I, in fact, I've still, I've still, that, that was, that was six or seven years ago. And I'm still, I'm still in touch with a number of those folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move into, um, some of the feature films. How did you kind of make that transition from doing these sketches, these shorts, these web series into actually turning that into a feature film? And what was your first feature film? Uh, I started doing short films first um, to kind of get the uh, just the, the the process down because there's so many mechanics that go into to producing a film. So I started doing short films, and uh, since I, you know I'm doing most of the stuff, so I needed to be uh, uh, proficient in, in pretty much the entire process. So I did uh, I did a couple of shorts. I did one uh, which was a short thriller um, called uh, The Hand of Now which is, uh, was nice. It was a, a, a friend of mine, Dan Stronsack, who wrote uh, the, the In the Name of the King film um, a number of years ago. He wrote that for me. And uh, the next one I did was, uh, was a short called Acting with Sharks, which is a comedy um, which takes place uh, in a workshop um, setting where uh, it's like a casting director workshop that uh, you've probably heard about. And uh, except the instructor's crazy, and uh, the actors are signing up to learn how to act with sharks, and uh, and that that was born out of a, a real situation in a in an acting workshop, uh, which uh, which I was in, and inevitably in any of these workshops, uh, Ashley, you know, there's always somebody that asks the question that is like what, but uh, the casting director was talking about how she had just cast a project where the actors needed to feel comfortable working with real sharks. And of course, somebody asked, well, you know, where do you learn to act with sharks? And I was like, well, in the workshop, duh. So I went home and I wrote Acting with Sharks and uh, um, uh, wrote, produced, and directed that. And uh, it's pretty funny. You should check it out. And then it's, uh, uh, um, and then from there, I kind of graduated to uh, features. I figured once I had those down, um, the process for making a short, it's just the same as it is a feature. It's just longer and more of it and more money. But uh, once uh, once I had that, I was ready to to take the leap into features. My first uh, my first feature was uh, Massacre on Isle Twelve, um, which is uh, just been released. Just been released now. It's uh, if you if you got Netflix, you can add it to your physical DVD queue. Um, if it's on uh, all the streaming services, uh, the DVD release is uh, is coming up. And uh, from there, we expect uh, uh, you'll be able to pick it up on on larger platforms as we go. Uh, we've we've met with uh, with some of the the larger larger ones. So I can't say yet, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully there. But uh, Massacre was a was a was a horror comedy script uh, that uh, I initially I initially found on um, Inktip, uh, which is a uh, a service uh, as you're familiar with uh, writers use. To uh, to kind of get their scripts out there, and uh, so I found I found it there, and uh, it was the original script was uh, by a guy named AJ Via, and uh, it was it was about 125 pages. It was uh, it was definitely written with a, a much higher budget in mind, and uh, in my in my arena, it would not have been producible. But um, I teamed up with my producing partner Jim Clock, who runs uh, Code Three Films, and. Uh, uh, we agreed that uh, we could develop that and make it something that that we could produce. So uh, I did a, a number of heavy rewrites on it. Uh, I got it down to a you know a producible 88, 89 pages, and 
added some characters and, and made a lot of changes to the story that could get it where I wanted it and incorporate more of my style of, of humor. And uh, from there, um, uh, Jim directed it. He co-directed it with uh, William Mark McCullough. And uh, um, we shot that in uh, Savannah, Georgia at the end of 2014. Okay. Um, I'm curious, at one point you just said you do, when you were doing these shorts, you were doing most of the stuff. I'm curious if you could break that out into some specific jobs. Were you, you, obviously you were acting in them and writing them, but were you also the producer, the director, the editor, um, you know, the sound editor, the sound mixer? Like how, how far, how deep did your, um, your actual work go? Uh, for the shorts, uh, okay, so um, Annie Lukowski directed The Hand of Now. I directed Acting with Sharks. Um, the uh, On the producing side, of course, that was uh, just all of that stuff, the financing, the producing, uh, acting in it as well. And uh, in terms of editing, I always have brought on somebody else to uh, to do that. Um, that's, uh, that's just not my strong point. I, I can edit, but and I did edit a lot of my early stuff, but it is very... It's it's a it's a tough job, and I, I really admire the the editors who can spend sixty hours just doing that. But uh, no, I I'm, I don't do the editing, um, but uh, pretty much everything else. Mm -hmm. How many scripts on Ink Tip did you read before you found this one that you liked and wanted to produce? I found uh, well, I, I read a lot, and I still do. In fact, I spend uh, I spend a lot of times uh, reading your pitches um, and uh, reading uh, this the ones on come through on ink tip and uh, I probably read I was looking for a, I was looking for a horror comedy so uh, I probably read maybe 15 15 scripts I think okay. and before I found one that that I liked uh, you know the nice thing about these services is you know you, you can read the log line and the synopsis and that that kind of tells you right away if you want to uh, if you want to read it or not but uh, you know that that Inktip sends out a, uh, a magazine with all of them, and what I'll do is I'll just go through and uh, I'll, I'll bookmark them and then circle the ones I want to read, and then I'll, uh, I'll reach out and read those. But uh, And it's the same with, with yours. Uh, when, you're, when your emails come through, I, I know that I've reached out to uh, some writers, and they've been very prompt in, in sending their scripts over. Okay. And I'm curious um, if on the business side there were some things about this script. I mean, we can see the poster behind you. Um, you know, there's a half-naked, you know, gorgeous w woman with, with big boobs. Um, was was there something where you taught, is this just sort of your flavor of comedy? Um, was there something you've talked to distributors that said, yeah, this is a kind of movie we think we can sell? What sort of made you gravitate towards horror comedy as opposed to maybe broad comedy or any number of other comedies that I'm sure you could plug your humor into? Well, I wanted to do really comedy. I mean, as a comedian, it's, it's just, it's really my favorite thing. Yeah. I, I love to make people, make people laugh and, uh, but it's harder to sell a comedy, just a straight comedy. Horror is, uh, on the low budget spectrum, horror is much, much easier to, to sell and get a distribution deal for, especially uh, uh, if you're considering overseas sales. Because with a, with a comedy, sometimes our sense of humor doesn't always translate to whatever that market is. But mm -hmm. the, the horror is pretty much universal, and that's easier to sell. So it's like, OK. Well, I want to make a comedy, but I also want to be able to get it distributed. So let's make a horror comedy. So that's where that came in. And uh, um, the big boobs do help. <laughs> so um, it, it, when I watched the trailer and it looked very, very contained inside this, this um, one store. And I'm curious if, again, when you're reading that script off of Ink Tip, did you know you had that location? Was there some sort of pieces that, as you're reading this script, you're thinking, yeah, we could shoot this? because um, you knew you had a location that would work. Well, going back to, to seeking out the script, uh, I was looking for one that was very minimal locations. Mm -hmm. and so when I found one that, that did take place in one location, that, that really piqued my interest. Um, no, we did not have a location. And um, you know, the, the movie wouldn't have been made if we hadn't found the location. And we were in pre-production, um, Jim Clock and I, Daryl Martinelli, the other producer on the project. Um, we were looking all over the country to find a, a suitable hardware store that we could use. Uh, we, had, we had considered shooting it in uh, New Jersey. We had found uh, 
a hardware store out there that we thought that, that might work. Um, and uh, Daryl Martinelli um, went out and, and met with them. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, we were kind of concerned about how they would think about the script because it is edgy humor and, and it is, uh, uh, well, you know, there's, there's a couple of, you know, sex scenes and stuff like that in there. So it's, uh, we waited till the last minute to send them the script. And then when Daryl got in there for the, uh, for the meeting, they're like, whoa, uh, have you read this? And he's like, yeah. They're like, yeah, you know, we're a family store, so we, we don't really want to do that. And we're like, ah, okay, well, we get it. So um, we ended up, uh, our co-director, uh, William Mark McCullough, um, lives in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, he's like, well, you know, I, I know a spot that might work. So he went and he reached out to uh, the owners of the location that we ended up shooting at. And uh, they were fine with it. And the location actually could not have been better. Because so many things that, that were in the script visually, we had there. Mm -hmm. And it was all in one location. And it was a huge, it was a 100-year-old hardware store that was over a whole city block and four stories tall. Huh. And over the years, it had just this part of this building then became part of the hardware store, and then they bought out the next one, and it just it had so many different visual uh, things in it that just really upped the production value. And then it had an amazing um, forklift-style elevator and this giant elevator shaft. So, of course, uh, you'll do rewrites uh, to suit your location, mm -hmm. and... Uh, when, as soon as I saw that elevator and that elevator shaft, it was I was like, okay, somebody's getting killed here. Like this is going to be a great kill. So uh, I, I I rewrote a scene so that we could get that in there. And uh, no, I mean the location was the key to that movie getting made because it, if we hadn't have found that, we just wouldn't have done it. And uh, we're very very blessed and fortunate that we did get that because we're getting down to the wire in terms of when that was going to be. A go or no go. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the um, process of, of raising the money and, and actually getting this thing into into production. Once you had the script kind of polished up, you had it where you wanted. What were your next steps to actually raise the money? And maybe you can talk about it, that a little bit. Just how you went out and um, how you financed this. Well, all the hard money came from me. Uh, okay. It was uh, it was uh, you know, it was something that uh, that I knew I was going to have to do, and. Uh, so I financed all, all the all of that. So that's uh, that was that was on my end. All the soft money came from my uh, producing partner Jim Clock and his company Code Three because they came in um, with uh, with Daryl Martinelli and uh, they had the equipment. So with his equipment and and my money, we were able to to make this happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's uh, it's quite an investment, and uh, you know I really had to to scramble. To make that work, um, you know, I, I put a lot of it on credit cards. I uh, took out a loan, um, but um, at the end of the day, I'm I'm really I couldn't be happier with the result. The mm -hmm. film is amazing and it's beautiful, and it's I'm just so proud of it. The work that that everybody did on this, and it just came together amazingly. So it, it was definitely worth it, and yeah. you know, we have, we have distribution, so that's a success. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, the trailer looks great, so I wish you luck Thank with you. that. Um, Thank so you. Got over, got over a million hits uh, on the teaser trailer. Um, very nice. amazing. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, um, so what's next for you? Maybe you can talk about kind of what the next step is after um, Massacre on Isle 12. Well, the next step, um, we've already got it in the can. It's another horror comedy um, called 6.66 p.m. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's another one location type of horror comedy and uh it's uh it's already been shot we're in post-production now um my composer uh, brooke de rosa is working on the score for that um then we'll go into sound design and color correction and then delivery on that one um so uh look for that one hopefully uh this fall um as perfect. well yeah perfect so just parting advice um what advice do you have for for screenwriters who move out to la and, and are looking to break in uh, well, a few things. I guess most importantly, the first thing I would say is don't wait until you feel like the situation is perfect to start. Because if you wait until you feel like everything is perfect, 
you're never going to be there and it's never going to happen and you're never going to you're never going to make it you're never going to make the movie you're never going to make the script you never just don't wait don't wait jump right in if you have a camera grab it start shooting something like just do it um if i had waited until the situation was spot on to make massacre if i had waited until i had all the money ahead of time i'd still be waiting to make it so i would say don't wait jump in there um I'd also say if if you're if you're if you're on the fence, you know, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of books I would recommend. There was one that I really enjoyed called uh, um, My First Movie uh, by Stephen Lowenstein, and it's uh, interviews with a number of uh, directors, uh, the Coen Brothers, Kevin Smith, Barry Levinson, um, just a whole bunch. And it's just it's a book of interviews about how they made their first movies, and it's it's I found it really insightful. Um, uh, there was a, there's another good book uh, I'd recommend called uh, What They Don't Teach You at Film School um, by uh, Camille Landon or Camille Landau, and uh, it's it's kind of a just a, a starter guide in, in terms of what to expect and what you'll need, and you know it's got a lot of useful information that uh, you'd learn it if you just went and did it, but it's nice to go in with that 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 knowledge ahead of time. But the number one thing is just don't. Just don't wait. Just get out there and do it, and you know, be prepared to fail. And if you fail, that's okay, um, because if you don't try, you're never gonna get it. But if you try and you fail, you will learn from that. You know, it's it, and that's what this business is. It's about trying and and facing rejection. It's about not getting the the answer that you want. Um, if it's if it's writing, writing is rewriting. You know, for uh, for the Fox show, I mean, that was just rewrite after rewrite after rewrite. And, uh, you know, some folks have the mentality. It's like, well, I've got it. Here it is. It's done. But, you know, as you well know, it's writing is rewriting. And if you're not writing, write something. And if you're not shooting something, shoot something. I mean, you can use your, your, your camera phone these days. It's fantastic. So just don't dilly-dally. Get out there and, and just do something. Mm -hmm sound advice so what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing um if you're on twitter you can mention your twitter handle if you're on facebook you can mention your facebook page anything you're comfortable sharing and i will round it all up put it in the show notes but um feel free to just mention any any kind of contact information okay sure yeah i'm on twitter at the uh, at chad ridgely um that's r-i-d-g-e-l-y i'm on facebook same handle instagram chad ridgely um, feel free to uh, to add me on those if anybody has any any questions. I'm I'm always happy to uh, to help somebody out and uh, give whatever advice I can. Um, you know, I've got I've got two produced and uh, distributed features now under my belt, which uh, is is great progress. You know, and mm -hmm. when people look around and they say, "Oh, this person over here is a is an overnight success," but you you dig a little deeper and you realize, you know, they've been out doing it in LA for ten years or so. Um, there's there's a there's a a saying attributed to Harrison Ford uh, in an interview where somebody asked him, "How did you make it?" And he said, "Well, I came out here on a bus with a hundred people, and eventually ninety nine of them left." And it, that's so true. It's perseverance. It's it's networking. It's meeting people that it, uh, that you can work with. That uh, when you move up, you can bring them up, and when they move up, they can help bring you up. Um, Relationships are exceptionally key in, in this business, and you know, people work with the same people over and over again, and you see that all the time. And uh, something that I've been doing. And uh, anyway, I would just say, you know, networking, relationships, and 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 do it. Mm -hmm. Sound advice, sound advice. Chad, I really appreciate your coming on and talking with me. I wish you luck with both of these films. And, um, you know, as you move along, you're always welcome to come back on. I'd love to hear um, updates from you. Awesome. I would love to. Thanks so much, Ashley. Perfect. Thank you, Chad. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high-quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three-pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but 
rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors concept, characters, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or an outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write a logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase it as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your script gets a recommend from a reader, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts, and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking for material. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay, at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing screenwriting coach Lee Jessup. She just wrote a book where she interviewed a whole bunch of writing of working screenwriters, and we go through some of the important insights that she's garnered while writing it. It's a great interview, and there's a ton of very poignant information for screenwriters. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. So to wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Chad. As I prepare to record the podcast each week, you know, I spend a few minutes just trying to think about some of the lessons that I've learned from the interview. And I feel a little bit like a brokered record because um, I think a lot of the lessons that um, I, I feel like I learned from Chad is just the hustle that he has is super inspiring and him just getting out there and making things happen and doing stuff. Um, you know, these are a lot of the same lessons that I talk about every week. And I've really kind of lately have had kind of a focus on bringing in writers to the podcast that are kind of like Chad, just making things happen, getting out there, doing projects projects and and just that's how you're going to advance your career not waiting for permission not waiting to find an agent just getting out there and doing stuff um, so I won't belabor that point too much but um, I hope this this was an interview you guys really liked and um, I hope it was as inspiring to you as it was to me because um, again I just love hearing from people and seeing people who are just out there and doing things I'm going to be doing a bunch more of these um, I've had recently a couple people that have done short films web series and I've got a bunch of more of those interviews recorded so again, we'll be going through this process and I think, um, Chad is obviously, you know, along a ways along in his career. So he's doing feature films. I don't necessarily recommend starting out with a feature film, um, probably starting with a short film, but you know, Chad has done a bunch of short films as well leading up to, to producing feature films. So I think that's a smart way to go. And I'll be bringing on some short filmmakers in the next couple of months as well. And I've got a whole different budget range. The short filmmakers are usually very happy to talk about budget. So we really talk talk about how much some of these short filmmakers spent on their films. And then, you know, you can kind of model your, your own situation, hopefully after some of these filmmakers and then just see a progression. And, um, you know, hopefully you, you go through a couple of short films and then get to the point where, um, you know, you reach that level where Chad is at, where he's actually producing feature films. Um, anyways, that's the show. Thank you for listening.